Now that Dr. Dombresco showed us our pacemakers and defibrillators, in particular for our heart failure patients, now we're going to talk to Dr. Zucker, who works at Newark Beth Israel Hospital as the director of the heart failure and transplant program. And we will see the new advances in heart failure and transplant. We're here today with Dr. Mark Zucker, the director of the heart failure treatment and transplant program. Hello, Dr. Zucker. Good afternoon, Dr. Clemente. How long have you been the director of the transplant program here? It's hard to believe, but we're now going on 23 years since I arrived in New Jersey from Chicago. Oh, heart transplantation is now the gold standard for patients with end-stage heart failure. Uh, expected survival after a transplant approach is about 13 years. Let's talk a little bit about the patient that needs a transplant. Obviously, we talk about end-stage heart failure and their survival one to two years, but what's the type of patient that you look for? Today, we would consider transplantation routinely in a patient who's in their early 70s as a, an acceptable option for that. Patients are individuals who generally can't walk from the bed to the bathroom without developing shortness of breath. But it's not just class four. I mean, we would consider transplantation in somebody whose cardiac function was very compromised, and we thought as doctors that their life expectancy was limited to no more than 12, 18 months. So when we, when we look at a, a transplant um, patient, um, you have to have a team, right? And you have, and, and there's very rigorous protocol before and after. You want to talk a little bit about the team and what a patient needs to go through? Well, successful programs are highly integrated programs that tend to involve social workers, nurses, pharmacists, dietitians, cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, and I think you get the sense that it's a multidisciplinary team of all individuals working together to try to make sure that we've identified the right individual from the medical point of view and the right individual from a psychosocial point of view such that we're confident and comfortable that that patient will likely survive the operation, has the financial resources to survive the operation, and has the family support to survive the operation. And then post-transplant, um, there's another pretty rigorous program to follow. The early perioperative period is very rigorous, but once you get beyond about three to six months, the patients pretty much return to normal function. After one year, we see them no more often than every three to six months. And, and obviously, there's probably many more candidates than hearts to go around. The, the estimate is, is that there are, and I don't know for sure if this estimate is correct, but that there are 50,000 potential individuals who might actually benefit from a heart in any given year. We only have 2,200 or 2,300 donors. Um, patients that may need a heart transplant, but for instance have cancer, or have kidney failure, or have significant lung problems, they won't be candidates for the transplant. You've identified a population of patients that's becoming increasingly problematic for us, and so we use mechanical pumps. This is an example of one of the mechanical pumps that we use. It's one of two that's currently approved uh, for use as a, what we call a left ventricular assist device, or an LVAD. And, and now, I mean, when you insert one of them, do they go in the body? Do they come out of the body? So this pump actually fits inside of the body. It enters uh, through an incision in the midline. We connect this to the apex or to the tip of the left ventricle. Uh, this returns the blood to the aorta. And this is not connected to a drive line, but there's a tube that comes out of the body to provide power to this pump. And there are two batteries that the individuals wear sometimes under their shoulders, sometimes they drop them in their pockets, and those batteries power these pumps for upwards of 12 hours. And, and it's remarkable because we have some patients that, that come walking into the office and um, they have a nice smile on their face because they're walking into the office with them. We have patients uh, with these devices and other centers have had patients with these devices who go skiing, who do all normal activities of daily living. There are limitations though, it's important to understand that because you have a drive line coming out of the body, you can't go in the pool, you can't go in the ocean. It's a little bit more complex to shower. And, and what do they have to worry about? What are some of the complications that can occur being on a pump? You can have a bleed from your stomach. Uh, if the anticoagulation doesn't work, you can unfortunately wind up with a stroke. The drive line, because it exits the body, uh, puts you at risk for infection. So they're not necessarily entirely benign. And as, as I said before, we consider transplantation as the last resort when nothing else works. We would consider this probably as a step before transplantation, but certainly I would prefer to do more non-invasive or more conventional interventions. And if you have to have one, I imagine that's life-changing to the patients. It is 
categorically life-changing to the patients. What's new? What's, what's coming up? What can we expect? Uh, what I see coming down the pike, so to speak, is that uh, we might be doing stem cell therapy to try to fix the patient's problems. We might be doing gene therapy to correct the genetic defect uh, that causes the heart failure to begin in the first place. And uh, as we were talking earlier, you're starting, one of, you're starting a stem cell protocol now. We are actively involved in a stem cell trial in which we take the patient's blood, we take the stem cells out, we replicate the stem cells outside of the body, and then we re-inject those stem cells into the heart using a three-dimensional mapping system to make sure that we've put them in the right spot. This trial is being performed for patients who have intractable chest pain or angina. There are other studies coming down the pike uh, to uh, evaluate and treat patients with stem cells for heart failure and for cardiomyopathy. Well, Mark, this has been very informative. Thank you for your time and good luck with your program. Thank you so much.